This is the lecture, Everything in Its Place. The quote is, without words to objectify and categorize our sensations and place them in relation to one another, we cannot evolve a tradition of what is real in the world. Ruth Hubbard. Represented by our mirage we have in their desert, what appears to be water and hope on the horizon, really it's just an illusion of the heat rising from the sand. Our learning goals, understand and apply taxonomic structure, develop and interpret a dichotomous key, classify and organize an organism based on taxonomy rules. Now we already knew that humans love to organize complex systems into smaller groups. We like to take a lot of things and put them into smaller little boxes so that they're easier to deal with. Now the things within those groups share commonalities with each other. There's a reason that we put the same things in the same box. Now unfortunately not everything fits neatly into a group and sometimes we just have to put something somewhere so we make it close enough. In the lab, we had an example of trying to sort things together. We now know that there are six kingdoms of life in our traditional structure. That's the way that most people have agreed to organize things. Not everybody agrees, and there are some other ways, but that's generally the one the, that we've kind of decided to go forward with as of right now. They're generally sorted by the properties of the cells of those things in that category. And each of those six kingdoms has rules that define it. Now, taxonomy what that means and what it's all about is having names for things so it makes it easier to talk about. That way, if I tell you that I have a pet and I say, yeah, I have a lovely pet named Circus. And you say, oh, what kind of pet do you have? And I say, oh, well, he's one of those furry ones. He has four legs and he purrs a lot and, and he meows when I get home. And you go, oh, okay, cool. I, I really love four-legged furry animals that purr and meow. It's a lot easier to say, I have a cat. And when I use that word cat, you know what it means. So the problem is, is that there's a lot of common organisms that have clear names like dog, cat, cow, horse, chicken, alligator. But not every organism in the world has that. From bacteria all the way to plants and fungus and animalia, everything needs to have some kind of name so that we can talk about it. So what we did was we came up with a naming system. Generally, the person who discovered it got the chance to make the name for it. The guy who came up with this whole system was a Swedish man in the 1700s. He was a professor, and his name was Carl Linnaeus. And because of that, we call this system of naming the Linnaean system. You know you're really successful when someone uses your name as an adjective, Linnaean. So he developed a consistent method for comparing organisms, for keeping records about them, and for being able to communicate about them. So he took all the organisms, gave them names, put them into groups, and then even put those groups into groups so it'd be highly organized and clear. The first thing that Carl Linnaeus had to do was Carl Linnaeus had to define what a species was. And so what he decided was that if two things, two, two living organisms could breed with each other and produce kids, that means those two things had to have been the same species. A cat and a dog are different species and we know that for sure because they can't have kids. A Two cats can produce kittens because they're the same species. Now we have other ways of doing this today with more modern technology. We can verify that with DNA analyses. But, um, but th this was the kind of the default definition. So we use binomial nomenclature. Now if we use what we know about words and etymology and roots, we can look at binomial nomenclature. Bi means two. Nomial means name, and then nomen is naming, and clature is system. So we have a two-name naming system. That gives us a pretty good idea of what binomial naming clature is already talking about. So we refer to that as the scientific name. We always have two words for it. For example, humans are known as homo sapiens. Now it's always in Latin. It's in Latin because in the past, 
for thousands of years, Latin was the standard academic language. Now, just in the past uh, couple hundred years, English has become dominant in academia, in schools and in colleges, but for a long time Latin was. So if you're ever in school, you had to speak Latin, all the books were written in Latin, everything was all about Latin. And Carl Linnaeus is from the 1700s, so he used Latin. So two names. The first word of that name is the genus. We always capitalize it and we always italicize it. Of our groups, which we'll talk about soon, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Genus is the smallest of the groups. Everything inside the genus group is very similar. For example, if we're looking at this species right here, Ursus maritimus, that's a polar bear. Polar bear is the common name. The scientific name is Ursus maritimus. So the first word there, Ursus, that's the genus. The genus Ursus has, for example, polar bears and brown bears and other kinds of bears. The, all the organisms inside the genus Ursus are very closely related. Now, if we look at the very top at the kingdom Animalia, everything in the kingdom Animalia is related as well, but not quite as close as the, as the creatures in genus Ursus. So the second word in the name is its species. So Ursus maritimus, if Ursus is the genus, then maritimus is the species. It's highly specific. Once you put the genus and species together, Ursus maritimus, it refers to only one specific kind of organism. The, um, that, that species is a Latin word. It's either a description of the organism. Uh, it might be where it was found, or it might be a Latinized version of the person's name. For example, maritimus sounds like maritime. It probably has to do with the fact that polar bears swim in the sea. And so it's the type of bear that you see out in oceans, like in the Arctic. So it's probably, you know, related to uh, its place. So let's look at a developing question. The pictured animal's scientific name is Felis domesticus, but his owner just calls him Circus. What genus does Circus belong in? All right, well, let's look at this. So the scientific name is Felis domesticus. First, note that the first word is capitalized and both words are italicized. That's the standard formatting for a scientific name. Now, there are two words there. The first word is the genus. So the answer here is Felis is the genus that Circus belongs to. Domesticus would be his species. Now notice the word domesticus. That probably refers to a trait. Felis domesticus is a house cat. Domesticus as in domesticated, which means to be calm and live with people. Now Felis is the genus. Anything in the genus Felis is going to be very similar. For example, another organism in the genus Felis would be a tiger. The scientific name of the tiger is Felis horribilis, as in horrible, because of how scary they can be. Let's look at a proficient question. Decide of the following living things whether they were named after a trait, a place, or a person. Our first is Emblioma Americanum. That was probably named after a place, Americanum. This tick here is probably some kind of North American tick. Ursidae carnivora. That's probably named after a trait, carnivora. That sounds like a carnivore, a meat eater. And there's our Ursidae. And then we have uh, Acleosanthes reitii. These Latin ones can be tough to pronounce. I think that one looks to me like it was named after a person. The person who discovered that flower is probably named Wright. Now, that those two eyes at the end, that's making it Latinized. So the person's name was probably Wright, 
but to make it Latinized, it was turned to right DI. And a mastery level question. Write an analogy between the scientific naming scheme and the format that was used when you were born to write your full name on your birth certificate. So this is an interesting analogy here. So let's look at this a little bit deeper. Let's use a famous person's name since I don't know yours. Let's use Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein, that name refers to one very specific person. Just like the scientific name, Belis Domesticus, refers specifically to house cats. So in this case though, the first word of Albert Einstein's name is the very specific one, Albert. And the second word, Einstein, is the closely knit group. The family of Einsteins all have a lot in common, kind of like the genus Felis all had a lot in common. So the last name of a person is kind of like a genus. Everything in it has a very close relationship. Now the first name is kind of like a species because if you know that this, the picture here, if you know that he's an Einstein, then we want to know, well, which Einstein is he? Which Einstein? Albert Einstein. And even just like the names of creatures are named after traits or places or people, Einstein, Ein, one, Stein, rock. Einstein means surrounded by stone. It probably refers to some kind of ancient town or settlement around mountains. Albert means noble or bright, which is a very fitting name for Albert Einstein. We have another word, dichotomous key. Let's look at the breakdown of that word to see if we can figure out what it means. Di means to, cotomous means to cut, and key is to open or explain. So it means to cut in two and explain. Now I know you might think er earlier we said by meant to. Our English words we pull from multiple different languages, so the difference can be whether we took it from Greek or from Latin. So what a dichotomous key is, it's a set of rules to distinguish between groups. It's kind of like a flowchart. There are yes-no statements, or there's some kind of question that has only one of two answers. So it lets us start with general and divide into smaller and smaller groups to classify what it is. Now this is a very simple, small dichotomous key, but it'll give a good example of how it works. So let's say we wanted to teach a young child how to know the difference between salamanders, lizards, tigers, gorillas, and humans. A larger dichotomous key would have all kinds of animals on it, but this one just has five. So if you have one of these animals and you want to know which one it is, you can start with one. And we start over here. And we will ask, dry skin, yes or no? If no, well then we already know that it's a salamander. But if yes, then we're following down to the next question. So yes, it has dry skin, but then does it have hair? If the answer to that is no, we've identified it's a lizard. Because yes to dry skin, no to hair, that specifically identifies it as a lizard. No other animal has that combination of answers to this, these questions. But let's say I say yes again. So yes, dry skin, yes, hair. Now we ask opposable thumbs. If no, that's a tiger. Tigers are yes dry skin, yes hair, but no opposable thumbs. But let's say the answer to this question is bipedal. And we say yes. So that means we've identified just by asking four questions, we can identify that this is a human. Of those five options, if we know yes dry skin, yes hair, yes opposable thumbs, yes bipedal, then we know we've gotten to human. So if we look at this dichotomous key, which is trying to decide between these eight celebrities. So let's, let's follow through the rules. So 
here is the format that a dichotomous key gets written in. So you'll start with your first question. If the celebrity is found in movies, go to A. In music, go to B. So if the answer to the question is movies, then we'll go down here to B. So it's kind of like following a flowchart. So we've gone there. But whenever we print out dichotomous keys, we don't print them as flowcharts. We print them in this formatting. So then we, then we go through if, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be for music. So music went to B. All right, so our music celebrity, if the celebrity is amazing, go to one, annoying, go to two. Let's say, for example, I'm listening to the music and I go, hmm, doesn't sound amazing, sounds annoying. Okay, let's go to do, um, B2. <clears throat> if you knew she was trouble and are never getting back together, it is Taylor Swift. If all their songs sound the same and they might be the worst band ever, it is Nickelback. So let's say uh, she's trouble, never ever getting back together. We've identified Taylor Swift. Okay, so in this developing question, in a dichotomous key, go to refers to, it refers to what the next question you're gonna ask is. So anytime you ask a question, you're gonna have two options. For example, in the first one here, has pointed ears or rounded ears to identify this creature. The pointed ears tells us go to question number three, has rounded ears tell us to go to question number two. And we just follow the outline and we keep going to where it is. If there's no more questions, then instead of saying go to, it'll tell us the name of the thing we're identifying. This proficient question, the word dichotomous means divided into parts. Explain how this definition explains a dichotomous chart works. Well, if we look here, this small dichotomous key has four possible answers. Duck, hen, lizard, snake. Those are the only four endpoints. So if I start at the beginning with feathers, after I ask the first question, does it have feathers or not? I either go yes or I go no. But which way I go, whether I cut up or cut down, I'm cutting my options in half. Because if I say, yes, it has feathers, then I'm saying, it's not any of these. And then if I say, swims, yes, no. No, does not swim. I'm cutting out this half, and I've narrowed it down just to one. Mastery. How does a dichotomous chart mimic the scientific method? Well, it starts with things that are general and then asks questions to find more information out so that we can result in an answer. It's a process of discovery. Now, try creating your own dichotomous chart for information relevant to you. Maybe it'll be how do you categorize and figure out which one of your favorite movies it is, or um, categorizing all the different sports, or maybe categorizing a list of different books or maybe characters. As long as you have a bunch of options to end with, and each question you ask narrows down the possible answers, then, then it'll be a good dichotomous chart. Now, we've talking about grouping. So far, we've talked about genus and species. But sometimes we need even more information than just that. Genus is the smaller, the smallest group possible that has the very specific species inside of it. But there are eight different levels here. So let's look at an example of the red fox. The red fox was actually named and categorized uh, given his scientific name by Carl Linnaeus himself in 1758. His scientific name is 
Volpes Volpes. I know that she has the same name twice, but we can tell which one's the genus and which one's the species because his genus comes first and it's capitalized. So he's in the genus Volpes and his species is Volpes too. But my red fox is actually in all of these groups, not just in one, because his very specific species is in the genus Volpes. There are other species in the genus Volpes, but the genus Volpes is in family Canidae. There are other, other genuses in Canidae. For example, um, all, all the other different kinds of canines and dogs, all are different genuses inside this family. Or, and that's in the order Carnivora, the carnivores. And then they're in the class Mammalia. Of the mammals, some are in the order Carnivora, some are in the order Herbivora. Some are carnivores, some are herbivores. But the point is, so my red fox is in all of these, all the way up to the largest domain, Eukarya. And that ex the domain Eukarya has thousands and thousands and thousands of creatures in it. But once you divide them into Kingdom Animalia, you have slightly less, because some of the things that were in domain Eukarya got put over in Kingdom Plants. But now everything in Kingdom Animalia has some things in common. They're animals. They're all animals. They have animal traits in common. But the most specific is the genus Vulpus, because that describes a very small group. Not all animals are foxes, but everything in the genus Vulpus is a different kind of fox. To remember all eight of these, we like to use things called mnemonics. We use mnemonics anytime we have something that we need to remember that can be particularly long or tricky, and particularly when the sequence is important. So an example of a mnemonic would be, did Katy Perry come over for grilled steaks? Now what that helps us do is remember the eight categories, because if we can remember that one sentence, did Katy Perry come over for grilled steaks? That can be an easier sentence to remember than, Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species? But if we can remember, did Katy Perry come over grilled steaks? We can look at the first letter of each of those words. Did. D. D for domain. Now we still have to remember that D stands for domain, but just having that clue, D, that at least gives us a hint to get us started. Did Katy. K. Kingdom. Okay, so it goes domain, domain kingdom. Did Katy Perry. P. Phylum. So it helps me get the right order all the way through. So try creating your own mnemonic. Whenever you write your own, it's a lot easier to remember these. It's okay how ridiculous it is. It's okay if it doesn't make any sense. It's okay if it's completely absurd. In fact, a lot of those you tend to remember more. What's important is, is that it's eight words long and the first letter of each word is the order D-K-P-C-O-F-G-S.